There is a cabinet meeting happening this evening discussing how the government continues to deal with the refugee crisis, a particular focus on housing those refugees. It comes amongst concerns expressed by some hoteliers that they need their rooms back in time for the high season. In other words, by April, they want to be back functioning as normal. Some of them, Owen O'Mara Walsh is the chief executive of the Irish Tourism Industry Council and he's with me now. Owen, you're welcome to the show. Have you an idea for us, own of, of how many rooms, what percentage of rooms in the hospitality industry are, are occupied by refugees at the moment? Well, it's, it's the Department of Children that contract with all the individual hotels. And we've got data from the, the Department of Children. It's about a month old at this stage, so it'll have moved on a little bit. But the last data we had was that 28% of all tourism beds in regional Ireland were contracted to government for Ukrainian refugees or asylum seekers. So that's obviously a big number. It's probably got bigger since the end of November when we got those numbers. And I I think the issue that we're kind of keen to impress is that, you know, that's fine in December, January, even February. But as soon as we get to St. Patrick's Day and beyond and you get into the high tourism season, we're going to need those tourism beds back for tourists because ultimately that's the the trade of hotels and guest houses and B&Bs. And tourism towns right up and down the length and breadth of the country need that tourism activity. So if the tourism beds are, are contracted elsewhere and not available to tourists, there's going to be significant economic problems. And the, the contracts that the department has with individual hotels, do they all expire at different times? Is there kind of a standard contract that's applied across the board? How does it yeah, work? It, 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 it's, it's different on an individual basis. Okay. So, so it, it's, it's actually quite difficult to glean all the information. But some of the contracts are, are short term, maybe three months, six months. Other contracts are longer, you know, 12 months plus. Um, and I, I, I think a lot of the hotels that have the shorter contracts that maybe are expiring around March, April, they'll want to get back into the tourism game because that's their bread and butter. That's their regular trade, if you like. Um, and that poses a problem for the government because, you know, if refugees um, can no longer stay in hotels because a contract has expired, where will those refugees be housed? So we've been calling on the government for quite some time to really, really take this seriously, to have a Department of Taoiseach-led approach and come up with a comprehensive plan as to how refugees now and into the future will be housed. And that should include all forms of accommodation, from modular housing to unused buildings to state dwellings to state institutions. It can't just be the tourism accommodation providers who are, who are the primary source of, of, of housing. And what type of blow would it represent to the industry where the government to turn around and say, yeah, listen, it'd be great if we could do all those things. We can't do them by April. We want to extend these contracts right across the board, right through the summer. Well, it'd be a significant blow. And effectively, we'd be sacrificing the tourism industry um, um, in response, if you like, to, our, to meet our humanitarian obligations. And that has significant economic consequences, like Fulcher Ireland, which is the state agency for tourism, estimate that for every euro a tourist spends on accommodation, €2.50 is spent on ancillary tourism services. So the hotels, to a certain extent, would be okay because they would get a rate from the government, albeit it's not as lucrative as the the tourism rate. But it's the downstream tourism businesses that would really suffer. So the restaurants, the pubs, the tourist attractions, the adventure centres, the the cultural experiences, they would miss out on the tourist dollar and lots of livelihoods and Mm. lots of jobs would be at risk. Well, you know, for some people listening, they think that's a price worth paying. You know, you mentioned kind of weighing that up against our humanitarian, uh, um, our, our humanitarian duties, and for well, some uh, of those uh, duties will outweigh the the, the, the financial yeah. impact. Well, uh, Minister Catherine Martin and, and indeed all the all the senior ministers and, and government have always said that hotels and guest houses and B and B are a short term solution, and and after all, it's not particularly good for refugees. You know, a refugee family who have fled a war-torn situation shouldn't be holed up in a hotel bedroom or a and b month after month after month. There has to be a better alternative. And the government have always vowed that there will be a better alternative, but we've yet to see it. And I, I suppose the other thing to keep in mind, Kieran, is that you know this isn't a two-month, three-month crisis. This is a two-year, three-year crisis. Like, even if the war in Ukraine magically ended tomorrow, which we all hope it will, um, those poor refugees have no homes to go back to. So, you know, this is going to be a sort of a, 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 a not just a short term, but an, a, a medium term a plan will need to be put in place. And as I say, the tourism and hospitality sector will do its bit as we're doing at the moment. Mm. But a lot of that bed stock needs to come back into the tourism economy. And, and there are swathes of the Wild Atlantic Way and swathes of Ireland. I, I think you're Kilkenny yourself. You know, tourism is really, really important. 
But if there's not the bed stock there for tourists, there will not be tourism activity. And, and what is your expectation, though, Owen? I mean, uh, given your experience of, of dealing with the state and other matters, you, you mentioned the promises that have been made to come up with a more comprehensive plan. We've been hearing those promises for about 10 months now. The yeah. idea that we're going to have a solution within three months seems a bit of a stretch. Yeah, I mean, cer- certainly, like you know, words words are cheap to a certain extent. I mean, we, what we need to see is, is, is action. And, and remember, like I mentioned, twenty eight percent. As I said, that that number we got about a month ago, six weeks ago, that could well have increased by now. And also, remember, it's increasing as each week goes by because more more refugees are coming on on a weekly basis. And I think it's right that we have a very broad, generous humanitarian approach. But we just can't, uh, if you like, lump the responsibility on one sector. And tourism is the country's largest indigenous industry. It's the biggest regional employer. And there'll be massive economic consequences if we get this wrong. So we need a much more balanced, creative approach to how, how we house refugees and asylum seekers. We can't just lump them into hotels and guest houses on a continuous basis. Tom McEnany is with us as well. Tom is the founder of Effective Aid Ukraine. Tom, you and I have had several conversations since last summer on this theme, how slow the government and state agencies and local authorities are to find alternative suitable accommodation for refugees. And here we are again. Yes, um, but things have changed somewhat, uh, Kieran. I wish I could say that things have changed for the better, but that's not quite the case. Um, there are specific changes taking place at the moment that your listeners are probably, in fact, are definitely um, unaware of. Uh, I've spoken to, over the last number of days, I've spoken to a number of developers, NGOs, people who, for different reasons, um, would be heavily involved in uh, accommodating uh, refugees, people who would engage with IPAS, the government agency responsible for it, on a regular basis. And what I've been told consistently for each of them is that IPAS is currently in chaos. I mean, it's always been grappling somewhat in order to deal with the numbers that have come on board. It's, it's not, it's on the ver- uh, according to one person I spoke to, it is on the verge of collapse. And all agreed that the government is likely to embark on some major reorganisation of IPAS. Now, what does this mean? Um, sorry, in terms of the, the disorganisation, one of the consequences of it has been that there's several thousand units of accommodation uh, that could have come on stream from private sources, that could have come on stream uh, months ago, and that haven't come on stream, that have been delayed just because there hasn't been any engagement. And you're right, of course, hotels were only ever supposed to be a short-term measure. Mind you, none of us, all of us hoped that the war would be a short-term war, mm. uh, but the, the, what happened was a lot of the accommodation that could have been made available, more suitable accommodation that might have been made available was. But in most cases, developers had to go off and invest significantly in making accommodation suitable, in restoring accommodation, in converting accommodation. And a lot of that com- accommodation, I am told as an absolute fact, has been sitting ready to go for the last two to three months and developers some developers are tearing their hair out yeah. trying to get somebody in my past to engage I'm sorry Tom and to go to question, are, are, to uh, uh, like what form does this accommodation take is this re- renovated older buildings is this new yes. buildings that have yes. been completed it's usually it? because the, 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 the accommodation that didn't require be, to be renovated would have used and that was available would have been made available back in March or April or May so this is largely accommodation that, that required some kind of restoration or some kind of conversion. I don't want to specify the particular accommodation because I don't want to get those... I don't want to risk identifying individual developers because it probably wouldn't help an already difficult relationship that they have with IPAS. Um, but it, this is not small scale. This is not 10 or 20 units in a piece of accommodation. This is... Um, um, all told thousands of units of accommodation. And there is another problem, Kieran, and there's a very specific problem, and any developer that you speak to that's engaging on contracts with IPASS right now would be able to confer- confirm this to you. IPASS has un- unilaterally decided that the rate for this accommodation is to be reduced by between 20 and 25%. So what it said to new developers, the people who put money in and who invested in the expectation that they would be getting a certain return per night, 
what they've said to them is that, uh, yes, we've decided to reduce that uh, nightly rate by 20 to 25%. There's no negotiation. You take it or leave it. 